Hey everyone, thanks for joining us this evening for another webinar brought to you by Central Indiana Section of the Audio Engineering Society. I'm Nate Sparks, current section chair of the section, and I want to provide a few housekeeping items before we get started this evening. Uh, first, if you're not an AES member, I highly encourage you to join. We have some amazing benefits to offer for students, faculty, and industry professionals. Uh, for a full list of benefits, more info on how to join, head on over to our website, uh, the main headquarters website, www.aes.org, and aes.org slash join for more membership info. Uh, the website's also a great web uh, resource for society news and white paper research and announcements for events such as this. Um, of course, you can also reach out to your local section for more info or questions on membership. Uh, the Central Indiana section can be reached at our website, centralindianaes.org. And we do have various social media contacts, which you can find at our website. Also, we'll make sure we put them down in the description below. Uh, if you uh, like what you see tonight, go ahead and hit thumbs up button and make sure you hit subscribe. You'll get notified of other events when we go live on our YouTube channel. Also want to mention we'll be sending out a post-event survey this evening shortly after our program ends. Uh, it's real important that you guys fill that out. It helps us kind of plan for these events and uh, makes it an overall better experience for you in the future. So we, we do read those as a committee and we do take them seriously. So please take the time to fill out that questionnaire as we send it out. Uh, we will send it out to all registered participants. So just look for that in your email. Um, I also do want to mention we'll be doing some Q&A at the end of the presentation. We're going to take the Q&A from the live chat this evening. So at any point during this presentation, just go ahead and put uh, your question down in the live chat and we will get to that at the end. Um, if you can't use the live chat, also feel free to email us. Our email is centralindianaaes at gmail.com. And uh, you can also uh, contact any of our social media outlets, and we will have a few people monitoring those locations for the Q&A. Uh, I think I took up a little bit too much of my time, so I'm going to go ahead and pass this over to Jay and get things kicked off tonight. Thanks, Jay. Okay, thanks, Nate. Uh, hi, I'm Jay Dill. Also, uh, part of the AES uh, Central Indiana group here. Uh, it is truly my privilege and honor to introduce these two longtime friends for tonight's event. First, Mr. Michael Pedersen. Michael is the Director of Corporate History at SURE and has been embedded there since the Gerald Ford administration. He is a contributing editor to, massive, to the massive Handbook for Sound Engineers Missile and sole author of numerous pro audio technical papers. In addition to being a published composer of choral arrangements, he is also a co-author of a biography about jazz guitarist Freddie Green, a 50-year veteran of Basie. Thank you, Michael, for joining us this evening. My pleasure. Also joining us tonight is Mr. Gino Sigismondi. Gino is the Associate Director of Technical Sport and Training at SURE and credits Sire Patterson with everything he knows. <laughs> Gino is a 25-year veteran in the music and audio industry. From humble beginnings with SURE, he has earned his way to overseeing what is the best technical support staff in the audio industry. And with his abundant <laughs> amount of spare time, Gino has also been the author of several SURE educational publications, such as Selection and Operation of Personal Monitors, the Audio Systems Guide for Music Educators, and the Selection and Operation of Audio Signal Processors. Gentlemen, thank you very much for allocating your valuable time with us this evening in our AES section. Please know that we all appreciate you very much. And with all this being said, gentlemen, take it away. Thanks, Jay. Uh, Gino, and I are gonna, yeah, Gino and I are going to kind of tag team this. Usually we're in the same room, and of course that's not possible anymore. So uh, he'll just <laughs> interject when he has some humorous things to say. <laughs> so thank you very much. Uh, yes, I have been there since the Ford administration. Thanks for reminding me of that, Jay. Uh, this is actually my 45th year at SURE. But tonight we're going to cover the history of the SURE Unidine microphones, uh, the 1, 2, and the 3, starting with the Model 55 all the way up through the SM58. And I think you're going to learn some interesting things because it's a pretty cool history. So here's the evolution of the Unidine motor. Uh, we, when we, we use the term motor in a uh, microphone sense, it's actually the element inside. And 
the first Unidyne 1 came out in 1939, Unidyne 2 in 1951, and Unidyne 3 in 1959. So here we go, 1939, that's when the Unidyne 1 came out, the Model 55. Uh, this was the world's first unidirectional moving coil dynamic microphone with a single capsule. That was a big deal. Uh, you could make directional microphones, particularly cardioids, before this, but it would take two elements, uh, typically a bidirectional and an omnidirectional in the same uh, enclosure itself, and then you would combine them electronically to make a cardioid. So to do it with one capsule really made it more efficient to manufacture, less expensive, and more reliable. Who invented the Uniphase network? The Uniphase acoustical ne network is the actual design inside the mic that makes it a, to a cardioid. And he did this was only 24 years old. If you've seen presentations of me in the past, I always bring this guy up because he was so important to Shure and to microphones in general. His name was Benjamin B. Bauer. And there's Ben Bauer at Shure around 1945 at our headquarters. Uh, he started out as a co-op student in 1936. And 10 years later, he was the vice president of engineering. This was one smart guy. In fact, when he passed away in 1979, he had over 100 patents to his name. The IEEE in 2014 considered the Unidyne as a key invention of the 20th century and presented Sure with an IEEE milestone award for the microphone. Here it is, January 31st, 2014, we had it. This is the milestone number 137. And these milestones recognize ideas and people and actions and projects that change the world of electrical engineering and computing. Give you an idea of other milestone awards. There's a milestone award given to Nikola Tesla for his work, creation of the internet, breaking of the Enigma code, the Apollo 11 moon landing, uh, and other things along those lines. It's really an amazing award for us to get. And this is, if you ever come to Sure, you can take a look at this. Of course, it'll have to be post-COVID because right now we don't have anybody there. November 19th, 1937. This is a very important day for us. This is a page from Ben Bauer's handwritten lab notebook. And this is his first description of the Uniphase Acoustical Network. I don't know if you can see my cursor here, but right there in the middle is the electrical equivalent of the acoustical network. Uh, I love that little line up at the top. It says, the following arrangement seems to offer possibilities. Yes, indeed, Ben, it changed microphones forever for after you wrote this page. That's a really an understatement of the ages here. That's what the first Unidyne prototype looked like. Doesn't look like much, does it? Uh, you can see the mic grill here, the diaphragm and the actual moving coil is behind there and this is the all magnetic structure but magnets were expensive back then and so to power up this prototype Ben simply stuck a horseshoe magnet to the bottom of it and there is the first working prototype this is in the archives at Shure. So we went from an industrial design prototype in 1938 and this is what the microphone was going to look like originally also, this is in the archive. This is a piece of wood, carved wood, painted silver. When Schur moved from Evanston, Illinois to Niles, Illinois in 2004, we were cleaning out every nook and cranny we could go into in the Evanston building. Someone crawled underneath the anechoic chamber and brought out a bunch of dusty boxes. And on one of the boxes, it was written 1938 Ben's microphone. And inside was this prototype. So we went from prototype to the, the manufactured manufacture product, product in basically two years. years. What, what was the inspiration for the appearance of the Unidyne? Even, even though if you don't know what's inside of it, everybody, even if you're not in the microphones, microphones knows what it looks like. like. And, and I think, think you will find this next slide quite interesting. interesting. This, this is the 1937 Oldsmobile Coupe 6. Does, does that, that look a like, little bit like a Unidyne one? It does to me. Uh, we, we don't, don't know, know if it's an inspiration or a coincidence. We doubt if it's a coincidence because Mr. Schur was a loyal driver of Oldsmobile cars. cars. I, don't I don't know if he had a 1937 Coupe 6, but I do know he had a 1935 Oldsmobile. So he may have looked at the front of his car one day and said, hey, that would make a pretty cool-looking microphone. By the way, it's past Christmas now, but next year, when Christmas comes around and they run for 24 hours a day, the Christmas story where little Ralphie wants a BB gun, Watch the, far, the car owned by his father. It is a 1937 Oldsmobile Coupe 6. And if you look at the scene where they have a flat tire, and look very carefully, 
behind them, you will see a big Unidyne microphone looking at you, which, of course, is the grill of the microphone, not the grill of the car. So he created this Unidyne industrial design. Well, we know that Ben Bauer created the insides, but this gentleman sitting down in front, Wesley Scherer, who wasn't even, a, doesn't even work for sure. He was an independent contractor. He was a graphics designer, basically, and he was designing letterhead and packaging and logos for us. And Mr. Schur gave him a chance to design a microphone. And I think he did a pretty good job. Uh, after he stopped being an independent designer, he went to work for Play School Toys. And for the rest of his life, he was a designer of toys in Chicago. So here's Ben Bauer back here with a little spit curl. Here's Wes Scherer there. And right in the middle is Mr. Schur. This is a photograph from 1938. Now, Michael, an interesting bit of yeah. trivia there, if I can interrupt yes, you for sir. a second. Yes, 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 yes you do. I, I think, uh, I think uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a softball question, but I think a lot of people might be surprised by the fact that we're throwing around these names of people that designed this iconic microphone, and the names aren't sure. Right, Ben Bauer, Wesley right. Sure. So right. uh, you know, it might, might I would might be just a little quick bit on well, what was Mr. Sure's role in all of this then, if he wasn't the one actually designing the microphones that bear his name? Mr. Sure was a geography major. Yeah, I got his degree from the University of Chicago, and he wanted to be a geography teacher. And he was unsuccessful in finding a job. So after a couple of years, his father kind of said to him, son, you better come up with something to do for your life. So he was a hobbyist, and he built AM radios. In the 19-teens, 1920s, AM radio were really the hobbies. So he was a huge fan of building radios. So he came up with the idea of a catalog company that sold radio parts. So if you look at Sure, when we were founded in 1925 and you see our first catalog, it's nothing but parts to build radios. So Mr. Sure was like a really great baseball manager. He was not an engineer himself, but he knew talent and he knew how to hire talent. And so he was the guy that funded the company and, uh, you know, bought the buildings and everything else, but he was not an engineer. In fact, you know, he only had one patent. It was a design patent for a chrome ring that suspended carbon microphones. But he did know smart people, and he hired smart people. Is that what you wanted to know? Mm -hmm. That's exactly what I wanted to hear. And and I'll add one more cinematic note to that 55. Um, well, I guess that's the Unidyne 2. We haven't gotten there yet. But uh, yep. for you Star Wars fans, if you watch Empire Strikes Back, the medical droid uh, is another uh, cinematic appearance of a 55, though not, well, I guess it's kind of more of a speaker than a microphone, I guess, the way they employed it in that design. But uh, um, another another uh, iconic use of that iconic design. Indeed. So March 1939, we introduced the Unidyne 1. Check out the price. It was $45. Doesn't sound like much, except when you convert it to 2021 currencies, when it's $835. So it was not a cheap microphone by any means. We also introduced, at that same day, our Rocket Model 50, which is our first ribbon dynamic microphone. So on March 11th, 1939, sure got into the dynamic microphone business, a ribbon and a moving coil. Here's our patent for the Unidyne 1. This is, the, uh, I, I want to point out, this drawing right here, that is the electrical equivalent of the acoustical network. This is exactly the same as that drawing from the Ben Bauer lab notebook. Uh, this is the most important patent in our history, there's no doubt, because we're still making microphones today in 2021, which use that same principle. You might note that the name up top is Ben Baumsweiger. So Ben Bauer's born name was Benjamin Baumsweiger. Uh, he was quite happy with that name until Schur started to get a lot of military contracts in the 1940s, 1941s, because World War II was coming. Every time military personnel would visit Schur and they would meet the head of uh, the best engineer we had, Ben Baumsweiger, the question was, Baumsweiger, is that a German name? And so just to get rid of that problem every time it happened, Ben shortened his name to Bauer. He took the first three letters and the last two letters, and that became his last name. He has two sons, which are still alive now. One of them uses Bauer. The other one uses Baumsweiger. Twelve years after the Unidyne 1 came out, we introduced the Unidyne 2. This is the 55S, and this is the same size that we still make today, and this is the one that Gino was talking about for Star Wars. Why did we make it? Very simple. Television was a new medium at the time, and television producers and directors were telling, sure, we'd like your Unidyne 1, but it's simply too large. 
covers too much of the person's face when they're on TV, so make a smaller version of it. So we came up with the smaller version, which is about 66% the size of the Unidyne 1. Here's a microphone now that's been in production in one form or another from 1951 all the way through 2021. So could be 70 years old. Just thought about that, Gino. We need to do something for that. <laughs> um, by 1952, that microphone was an immediate success. Unidyne 1 was very successful. Unidyne 2 took off even faster. And we ran this ad, the microphone that needs no name. I just want you to take a look at that uh, ad over here and notice the name sure doesn't appear anywhere in it. That's how popular it had become uh, in such a short period of time. So in the 40s and the 50s, the Unidyne 1 and the Unidyne 2 were very, very popular microphones for broadcasting, but certainly more popular for live sound. Elvis was seen so much often with the Unidyne 1 that people still today refer to it as the Elvis microphone. Frank Sinatra was often seen with the Unidyne 2, and here he is with the Unidyne 2 old blue eyes. Uh, we got a story about Mr. Sinatra later. Actually, it's a personal story, which uh, I can only tell you that I'm happy I lived to tell the story after this encounter with Mr. Sinatra. So, 20 years. So before you go on there, Michael, I'll just add in another thing, just because it struck me as I, when the, the first slide you had of the Unidyne 2 showed it with blue cloth inside of it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We can tell that story. Uh, That's a great story. Yeah. Well, it's just, it's, and it's, yeah, you can tell a, a little bit more about what that was. But, you know, the, the, there, as Michael alluded to, there are several, you know, that that microphone continues to be produced in actually several different variations um, now for a long time. Uh, Michael, I guess you would know what year we started with the 55 SH Series 2. That would have been in the 80s at some point, I believe, right? Uh, 89 approximately, yep. Yeah, and that was had black foam inside, no colors, and it had a, had a switch on it, and it was not the same mic element any longer. It was a you know more updated mic element, still based on the same principles, of course. Uh, and for a long time, uh, you know, working in tech support, as long as I've been there, the question that we get used to get asked so much was like, "Hey, can you put an SM58 inside of there, or can you put a Beta 58 inside of there?" You know, people always wanted to put different microphones inside of there uh, to try and you know improve or change the sound quality or, or whatever. And uh, in uh, in the 2000s, we finally did that. We put actually what is a Beta 58 Super Cardioid cartridge inside of a, a Unidyne 2 housing with blue foam, yeah, which made a lot of people happy. 2009, okay. Yep. Um, except we were getting complaints from people saying, this doesn't look right. Why is it blue? Shouldn't it be black? But if you go back and you look at this here, it was indeed blue as well as other colors. Right, Michael? Yeah. Uh, that was one thing. I, I couldn't figure out something. This is a kind of interesting story. So if you go back and look at the Unidyne 1 and the Unidyne 2, and you look at the catalogs in the 1950s and the 1940s, they were all black and white, and nowhere did it ever tell you the color of the... Uh, well, it, was, it wasn't foam back then, but the color of the cloth that's inside there. I couldn't figure out what that was. Uh, and I would look at microphones in the archives, and there were blue, and there were red, and there was black, and so forth. And it just didn't make any sense to me about why that was. Well, eventually I found out what it was. Sure used to go to a, uh, a large fabric store in Evanston, Illinois, where I am right now, called Vogue Fabric. And they would take a device that would measure the acoustic impedance of cloth. You would blow air through it and see how much air came out of it. That would be the acoustic impedance. So they would go down there and they would find cloth that was all one color and blow air through it. And when they found a bolt of cloth that had the right acoustic impedance, they bought that cloth and that was the color for the microphone until that bolt ran out. And then they went and got another one. So they, the, uh, the authorized colors were blue, black, red they actually had white for a while but think about that everybody smoked back then so you can imagine how long the white would look <laughs> would last yellow it turned yellow yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah but that's the reason you see all these different colors is because yeah. they changed and uh, we yeah. just never put that in the catalog so you couldn't complain that you got the wrong color <laughs> <laughs> and now we, now you can get it again the super 55 is with is is with the blue foam and then we have the right. black on black version the a black right. 
Super 55 with black foam inside. If you watch any of the copious amounts of Metallica concerts they've uploaded since the uh, the pandemic started onto their YouTube channel, you'll see lots of um, black on black 55s. And I think even some of the black and red ones, which was kind of a limited edition thing we did a few years ago. Yeah, um, yeah. And, black, of course, and the, the black the, mic with yeah. the red foam. And the chrome one. And then there was a gold one last night on the uh, Celebration of America one. So... Hmm. So here it is, 20 years after the Unidyne 1, and we bring out the Unidyne 3. This is the Model 545. It was advertised at the time as the world's smallest cardioid dynamic microphone, had a price of $50. And uh, I know it's AES people noticed no XLR connector. It had an Amphenol connector because Amphenol connectors, which were introduced in the 30s, were much more popular than XLRs were in the 50s. So we had to say Amphenol. Amphenol actually is a good connector. Uh, nothing wrong with it, except it takes a little bit longer to plug in and plug out than an XLR. So we learned about Ben Bauer before, who did the Unidyne 1 and the Unidyne 2. Ben left Schur in 1958 to become the head of research uh, at CBS Labs. And this gentleman was a student of Ben's for a few years. His name is Ernie Seeler. Uh, he started at Sure in 1953 and left uh, retired in 1997, born in Cuba, which is interesting because Ben Bauer also lived in Cuba as part of his, when he was a youth. But this was the first big microphone that Ernie brought out. And it was an end address. It was a microphone you spoke into the end of instead of the side of. That may not seem like a very big deal, but when you hit an end address microphone, you can make a polar pattern that's far more uniform at all frequencies. And this improves game before feedback. Basically, you can turn it up louder uh, on stage and have it not feedback. And of course, rock and roll was starting to really become popular in the 50s and early 60s. Interestingly enough, Ernie hated rock music. He just really bugged him that his microphone was so popular in rock and roll. But Ernie didn't think his microphone was perfect. He wanted the top end of it to be flat. That presence peak that we've all known now that our Unidyne microphones have, which most people love, starting at around 2 kilohertz and peaking off around 6 kilohertz, was something that he just didn't want. He tried really hard to get rid of it. Fortunately, he didn't because I think if it had been a flat response microphone, it would not be as popular as it has been for the low these 60 years. Here's another person that's sure that you probably have never heard of, Bob Carr. This is Bob. Uh, he was a mentor of mine when I was at Sure, and he was tasked in the early 60s by Mr. Sure to try to get micro Sure microphones into studios. At the time, we had our microphones were great for live sound, but in radio and television and film studios at the time, RCA, AKG, and Electro Voice owned that market, and Mr. Sure wanted to get a part of it. So he said, Bob, figure out how to do it. So Bob didn't, he was basically a one-man band, and he didn't really have a lot of engineering at his disposal because at the time, phonograph cartridges were sure his main business. So Bob came up with the idea of taking microphones that already existed in the sure line and changing them a little bit by, first of all, if they were chrome, give them a dark, non-reflective finish so they could be on camera and not reflect light. If they had an Amphenol connector, change it to an XLR because broadcasters preferred the XLR. If they are high impedance or unbalanced, make them balanced and low impedance. And if they had an on-off switch, remove it or at least cover it with a plate. So in 1964, Bob brought out five microphones that were our first SM line, studio microphones. The 33, the 50, the 56, and the 76 were all variations of microphones that were already had in their standard line. The only really new one was the one there I've shown to the right, expanded, which is called the SM5, which is a voiceover mic. But I do want to show you one other interesting thing. So if you take a look at Bob's photo up here, and you look in the back where there's the two photos of his kids, you see a microphone here that's a long rectangle. That is a Shure SM3 ribbon microphone. That was going to be our first SM mic, and it was designed to go up against the RCA ribbon microphones. We never brought it out. Uh, I think we made about 10 of them. The Shure Archives has a few. And every now and then one shows up at eBay. The last one I saw, a guy in Canada had one on, at eBay, I think it was about five years ago. He wanted $3,000 for it. It's a nice mic, but uh, not that much. <laughs> so 1964, uh, here's a microphone that you may recognize. This is the predecessor to the SM57, called an SM56. Uh, this was the first 
microphone that we brought out that ended up being popular for rock and roll. We'll talk a little more about that in the future. $81. It's got a non-reflective finish, XLR connector. The front plate covered the switch itself, uh, and the switch actually had three positions, high impedance, off, and low impedance. But the really one thing I want you to take a look at is this finish. This is not a poor photograph. This is actually what the original finish looked like. It was a lighter gray body and darker gray specks on it, like a speckled finish. And we used that finish on the SM mics for about 10 years. Beatles were a big user of our 545. Remember the Unidyne 3 that came out in 1959 was called a Model 545. Here they are performing in Chicago at Comiskey, Ball, uh, Comiskey Ballpark, the Ballpark Stadium. Uh, I like this. He's the biggest band in the world, and they're holding the windscreen on with a rubber band. Interesting story about this one. Uh, when the Beatles went on tour in 1965, Shure loaned Beatle management 12 545s plus the, shot, the uh, adapter and this quick disc mount. This allowed you to take the microphone off the stand very quickly. I actually had some rubber shock mounting in there as well. And the deal was when the tour was over, the Beatles were to return the 545s to Shure, and then Shure was going to auction them off to crazy teenagers for charity. Well, tour ends, I think it ended in August or maybe September. A month goes by, no Beatles mic. Eventually, Shure Public Relations decides to call up Beatle Management and say, hey, where are those mics you promised us? Beatle Management says, oh, we shipped them back. You know, about a, about a week after the tour ended, we shipped them back to your service department. We say, did you put any notice in there from the Beatles or anything else? He says, no, we just put them in a, you know, we figured you guys would know. Put them in a cardboard box, shipped them back, and that was it. Well, they did a little research, found out that the service department, yep, yeah, we got this book, you know, 12, 12 545s. We didn't know what to do with them. There was no customer name, anything like that, so we scrapped them. <laughs> Boy, don't we wish we had those microphones now. Yeah, someone would probably pay a few dollars for those. I think so. Year after the SM56 came out, the SM57 came out, and of course, it's still a uh, current model today. Sixty-three dollars. Actually, uh, what are they now, Gino or Jay? Are they ninety-nine dollars map, something like that. No, okay, sure. it's eighty-nine. Eighty-nine. Yeah. Okay yeah. Yeah. Anyways, it, yeah, it hasn't gone up much since then. Uh, part of the jobs I had for twenty years, from nineteen eighty-eight to two thousand eight, I was Shure's liaison to the White House, to the White House Communications Agency. Uh, these microphones have been used for the President of the United States uh, since Lyndon Johnson, all the way through now newly uh, sworn in President Biden. Uh, the Waka inventory is over 400 SM57s. And though we always like to say this, uh, though they've never had a single failure, but there have been more numerous presidential misstatements through SM57s than any <laughs> other microphone in the world. And of course, 1966, we bring out the SM58. Notice that mottled finish again, the lighter gray with the darker gray specks on it. It was $81 in 1986, as far as the pro user net. But you may be surprised that the first year sales were 145 units for the entire year. In fact, our annual sales never exceeded 1,000 until 1971. And that actually turned out to be a problem, which we're going to talk about a little bit later. So it was not a big hit. It took the SM58 about 10 years to really become popular. I think it's worth... Uh maybe just dwelling for a second on the price thing, right? I mean, think about that. It was $81 when it came out in the 60s. It's $99 now. Now compare that to what you talked about with the 55, you know, like what that was in, in dollars then, right, versus dollars now. So 50, S&58s, people think, well, the price hasn't gone up in 40 years. It's, it. I mean, in counting inflation, it's actually gone down, right? The fact that we've yeah, been able to right. make it at that same price for that long. Um, so really, that, and that proves that the, the, the mic itself, we haven't been static with it. In other words, there's been constant improvements, you know, to keep it up to date and to keep it, you know, the same reliability, the same sound quality, but not let the price skyrocket along with inflation. Yes, yeah, a lot, a lot of different, a lot of different changes as far as how we manufacture them over the years. But uh, you know, it's just th things like we we do laser welding now instead of adhesives and so forth. So a lot of that speeds up production and, and makes it uh, you know allows you to keep those costs down. So 
Monterey Pop Festival, June 1967. This was a big deal because this is really the first large outdoor concert two years before Woodstock where major rock and roll acts appeared, and it was in Monterey, California. McCune Sound of San Francisco supplied the PA. A guy named Abe Jacobs specified all the gear, and Abe really liked the SM56, and plus gave him better game before feedback on stage. We already talked about that. So all the microphones, there are two stages. Uh, there was a smaller stage, and if you see any of the Monterey Pop stuff, those are AKG mics. And on the main stage, they were all SM56s. So here's Jimi Hendrix performing with a uh, SM56 and an A2WS windscreen on it. But Hendrix was there, Janis Joplin, The Who, Jefferson Airplane, The Birds, The Mamas and Papas, Rolling Stones were in the audience. It was a really amazing thing. But this was the really first major event where... Big popular performers at the time saw and heard Sure SM microphones. As a matter of fact, in our archive, we have one of those SM56s that we use at Monterey Pop in 1967. And here's a photo of it. If you look real closely there, it says McCune, number 43, and this is a Harry McCune sticker. In 1966, McCune purchased 50 SM56s for their rental inventory, and they and engraved them all. So this was one of the first of 50 because it's number 43. And this red sticker here is very specific to McCune. This is a few years later. This is Hendrix again. This is in Southern California at an outdoor festival, and you can see that McCune sticker. Now, where did I get this? It was the eBay find. I was on eBay one day, and I wasn't particularly interested in another beat-up SM56 until I saw the McCune sound sticker. And then I saw that number 43, and there was a buy it now button, and believe me, I bought it now. So that's <laughs> in the archives. Again, a lot of people, when they come and visit the archives, this is one of the things they want to have a photo taken of. And of course, we're happy to do that. Woodstock, two years later. Uh, again, Unidyne 3s, but this time they were not. SM microphones, they were the Model 565. And here's Richie Havens. There's a uh, 565 on his vocals, 565 on his guitar. Joe Cocker with the 565. It was the only microphone used on stage at Woodstock. These all came uh, <clears throat> from Bill Hanley in Massachusetts. These were microphones from his rental stock. And he used all the same microphones because most of the roadies, not the roadies, most of the stagehands at Woodstock were simply volunteers. And they didn't have time to teach him about, well, no, that microphone goes on just drum or on drums and these microphones are for guitars. So they made them all the same. And so they, all he had to do is say, put a microphone on the guitar amp, put a microphone over the drums. It was all the same microphones. These were standard microphones except for one thing. They had an adapter on them that converted the Amphenol connector into a female XLR. So this was about two years before Sure brought out a 565 with an XLR connector on it. And if you look really closely here, it's kind of hard to see, but there's about an additional inch of length here, and that's the adapter that went from the Amphenol to the female XLR. Now, Michael, is there any particular reason, um, if you've ever heard from, from anyone over at Hanley, why they chose the 565 instead of the SM58? Or they already owned, that's what they, Hanley, they, that's they, what they, they already owned them. Yeah, they already owned them. It was a rental gig. They didn't expect to make any money, uh, so they weren't going to buy anything new for it. They had been using the 565s at the Fillmore East in New York City. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it's it's like, you know, it's always the Occam's razor. The simplest explanation is typically the right one that's right. So they had them. Let's use them. So sure was going down the wrong path. Again, we, we thought SM microphones, we were trying to sell these to studios, and we were trying to sell SM microphones to broadcasters. And so here's the first time that we did an ad for the SM58s in 1970. And I, the entire copy, which I won't read to you, is written for the broadcasting market. You know, it suppresses pop. Uh, and so, again, we're just kind of trying to sell it over here and not really seeing that the rock and roll market is starting to pick up on this microphone. Sales were so poor on the SM56 and the SM57 and the SM58 that in the 1970s, early 70s, they were seriously being considered for discontinuation because none of the models were selling nearly close to what Bob Carr thought they would sell. So Roger Ponto, who was the national sales manager at the time, was the guy who hired me, said he got called into a meeting with the vice president of sales and said, you know, these SM microphones aren't doing anything. Let's get rid of them. 
And Roger said, well, before we do that, maybe I could take them to Las Vegas and show them the sound guys at Las Vegas and see if they would make a good microphone for live sound. And because of that move, the SM line was saved. Here's another Unidyne 3, the Shure SM7. This is a Unidyne 3 variation, a voiceover microphone. What's really weird about this microphone is that from, 2000 and, from 1972 to 2008, it basically sold the same amount every time. It wasn't a great selling microphone, but it wasn't a bad selling microphone. It's just one of those average selling microphones. And in 2008, podcasters got a hold of this, and then podcasters started telling each other, and pretty soon the sales started to increase and increase. And then in 2015 or 16, gamers got a hold of these and started buying them for gaming. And now after COVID, in 2020, the microphone's 48 years old, and it's the biggest sales year ever of this microphone, even though it's 48 years old. As a matter of fact, uh, our sales in 2020 are approximately 100 times greater than they were in 2000. It's really an amazing story. It's the weird thing about microphones. You just never know when they're going to take off and become popular. And Michael, the SM7, you know, was obviously designed to replace the SM5B. Was the SM5 also a Unidyne 3 element? Yes, yeah, the SM5 was a, SM5 was a definitely Unidyne 3. In fact, it was a, even a little bit closer to an SM57 cartridge than the SM7 was. Yeah, definitely Unidyne 3. It's what Bob had, you know, overhead boom mics, which the SM5 was designed to be, were condenser mics. We didn't have condenser technology in the 60s. Sure didn't make any condenser mics then. So they took what the best they had, which is Unidyne 3, and tried to turn it into a boom mic. Guess what? Didn't work out very well. <laughs> but yes, it was Unidyne I don't know. There's yeah. several people that show up at trade shows every year that would probably disagree with you on that, but that's about it. So <laughs> Yeah, but uh, as I'd like to say, the most in the best year ever of the SM5, we sold 250 units. So <laughs> it was never a big seller. Yeah. Ah, 1977. So here's my Sinatra story. So in the mid-70s, mid SM58s are starting to pick up. Frank Sinatra was a loyal user of it as a wired microphone, typically. And we have a mic there called an SM59, which probably most of you don't know, and rightfully so. So I was new at Sure, and Roger Ponto was my boss, and the SM59 comes out. And Roger says, all right, Michael, you and I are going to go to Vegas, and we're going to try to show the sound guys this new SM59 because it's really an amazing microphone. So we get out to Vegas, and we're showing it to some of the sound guys, and really their reaction is a little bit, you know, lukewarm. So Roger says to me one day, hey, Sinatra's over at Caesar's Palace. Go over there, talk to Dave Rogers. He's the house sound guy, and see if you can get Sinatra to try out the SM59 uh, for a rehearsal. So I'm like 23 years old. I have no idea that Sinatra has a reputation. And so I go over to Caesar's Palace with my SM59 in my uh, briefcase, meet Dave Rogers. Dave says, oh, yeah, we can do this. I said, I'll, I'll tell Sinatra sound man to try it. So I'm in the sound booth. I'm about probably 100 feet away from the stage. And Dave walks down to the stage with the SM59 and starts talking to the Sinatra sound guy. And I can see, even from 100 feet away, there's a really animated conversation going on there, and it doesn't look like it's going very well. Well, eventually I see Sinatra's sound guy kind of shrug his shoulders. He walks over, unplugs the wired SM58 Sinatra was going to use, and plugs in the SM59. And Dave comes back to the sound booth and says, hey, he's going to try it out. It's going to be great. So Sinatra comes out, and he's got a towel around his neck, and he says hi to the band and so forth. And then all of a sudden he knows it's, that it's not his SM58. And I will clean this up just because it's a family audience. And he says to the sound guy, hey, where's my friendly SM58? Except it wasn't friendly. And the sound guy says, oh, Frank, this is a new microphone from Sure. They want you to try it out. Would you give it a whirl? Uh, yeah, okay. So he counts off the first tune. I think it was called Come Fly With Me. That's typically what he opened with. And he sang no more than eight bars, and he takes the 59 off the stand and with all of his might throws it stage left, and it bounces around on the floor, hits the wall, and, and you hear this guy scream, Get me my 58! Sound man runs over, unplugs the 59, plugs in the 58, puts it on the stand. Sinatra's happy now. Sound man didn't lose his head. And rehearsal goes on. So things calm down now, and the sound man comes up, 
to the sound booth where I'm sitting with Dave Rogers. I don't, I think I, my face was probably completely white. And he hands me the SM59 and says very quietly, he didn't like it. <laughs> <laughs> so that was my one encounter with uh-huh. Mr. Sinatra. And as it says there at the bottom, tell that kid from sure not to come back. Ah, rock and roll abuse. Now here's another loyal SM58 uh, user, Roger Daltrey. And Roger's been using the SM58 since it came out in 1966, still uses it today. Of course, he's very, very famous for swinging the microphone around and banging it on the floor every now and then. And I believe that we have a video that I hope will work that lets him tell his own SM58 story. So, guys, let's see if we can cue that up. Well, I, I've found this microphone to be absolutely remarkable. And no one's more abusive to a microphone than I am. Uh, not only with the bad vocals but <laughs> and the bum notes, but, you know, generally misuse of a mic completely. Like, I remember I did a, a thing for sure, and uh, to demonstrate how good this mic was, I slammed it at the floor deliberately. Bang! Like that. And then picked it up and did the rest of the interview with the crowd with the microphone. It didn't break it, didn't change the sound of it. It was extraordinary. Well, the, uh, the, the swinging of the microphone... Um, I, I can't really remember when it started. I think it kind of started in 1967, out of boredom. We, we used to do very long, kind of guitarists have lots of things to play with when the band goes into a jam. And I used to just get totally bored. And uh, so I just used to play with it. And I thought, well, this is interesting. And it, I could do more and more things with it. And in those days when I had my eyesight, I could... I ended up, I could take a cigarette out of someone's mouth from about 20 feet away. <laughs> I got that, that good with it. Very kindly, sure, I, I said to Shaw, do you mind if um, we keep the microphones after every show and I donate them to charities? Because singers have very little they can give to auctions and things where people are trying to raise money for, for foundations. And kindly, Shaw said, yep, you can have every one. And uh, since then, they're now fetching really good money for lots of good causes all around the world. So that's, that's really brilliant. And I thank them for that. I love that story. I love that story. And, and of course, I'm pretty certain that the cigarette that he was flipping out of the, out of the mouth was Peter Townsend, who tended to play guitar solos mm. that bored Roger Daltrey. <clears throat> they're, they're like a couple that's been married 50 years old, you know, right? 50 years and just like get on each other's nerves, you know? <laughs> yep, yep. But what a show. What a show. So in 2008, here's a, this is the letter that I found in the archive written by Mrs. Schur. Of course, Mrs. Schur was married to Mr. Schur, and she ran the company from ni- 1995 to 2016. And this is a letter that she penned to Roger Daltrey. And I'll just get a little quote there to read for you. The image of swinging your microphone by its cable into the air is engraved in the history of rock. In your role as the front man for the Hugh Who, you provided enormous visibility for our model SM58 and inspired countless musicians to follow in your path. And she got a lovely letter back from Mr. Daltrey as well. 2017, we uh, partnered with the Who and Sir Paul McCartney to auction off some limited edition SM58 microphones with custom graphics. Now, the graphics on the microphones were designed by people that worked for the Who and people that worked for McCartney. Um, we auctioned them off. All the proceeds went to charitable foundations that the WHO invested, uh, the WHO basically supports, which is Teen Cancer America and McCartney's Meat Free Mondays. So uh, <clears throat> these 50th anniversary artist editions were like a commemorative purchase and donation. There were 300 SF58s for each auction, and then numbers, uh, the serial numbers 1 through 10 were actually hand-signed by the artist. And I think it was number one on each were hand-signed in gold ink. I saw one on eBay recently. It was a McCartney signed in silver ink, and the guy was asking $2,500 for it. So uh, some fun at the end. Uh, This is not Paul McCartney. This is John Cleese. But this is just some silly questions and answers that we get all the time. What does Unidyne mean? It's a trademark that sure made a made up a name we made up and it got patented or excuse me trademarked in 1960 and basically has multiple names. Uni stands for a single mic element and a unidirectional pattern, and Dyne is a dynamic microphone element, but it's also a unit of force that's used in acoustics. So you combine the two and you get a 
term that can mean essentially four different things. What does 58 mean in S58? We always could ask that. Wow, that's such a great number. Why did you choose that? It's just a sequence. We had the model 55. It came then the 55. Yeah, it came, <laughs> it came next. Yeah, it wraps it up, Gino. It came next. 55S, <laughs> 56, 57, 58. 59, there was a 60, there was a 61, there was a 62, there was a 63. You get it. Nothing more than that. Yeah. But interestingly there was enough, a point. SF yeah. Sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. I was going to say, interestingly enough, right, um, and at one point in time, the 50, the 5 in front of it did indicate a dynamic microphone from correct. there. We have not adhered to that any longer. Um, and anything with an 8 was a condenser microphone. Anything with a 3 was a ribbon microphone. You know, we had yep. that. We There was actually some sense to those. We, we've since changed it around. And because of the you know ubiquitous of the sm58 as a uh as a handheld vocal microphone is now that kind of got extrapolated out to other lines that sure has but still keeping that nomenclature i mean the most obvious example is the beta 58 right um yes. which is just another it's another dynamic microphone but it's actually it's not a, a unidyne um specifically but again it's a similar principle it just happens to be super cardioid and a neodymium magnet but but the fact that it was a handheld vocal mic it was a beta 58 and then now we have the pga 58 and then uh but in kind of keeping but kind of not now there's the ksm8 which is the sort of latest and greatest development in dynamic mics where it's a it's a it's actually a dual diaphragm dynamic microphone but um you know we've so we've sort of taken that 58 and just extrapolated it out so that it it you know now if you're looking at the sure lineup and you want a vocal mic you know that sm that if it's got a 58 it's a vocal mic yeah, we, we, we thought about using KSM58, but we just thought that would be too confusing. You know, yeah. SM58 and KSM58, so we just dropped the five. Uh, by the way, SM58 is a registered trademark of a of Sure, so you, that's why you, you will never see uh, another company use that. And if they do, we knock on their door and say, sorry, that's a registered sorry. trademark. Yep. Differences between 57 and 58. So don't believe what you read on the Internet because most of it is wrong. They are both unidyne threes. The primary, the fundamental difference between the two is basically the protective grill or the grill that's over the 57. So the 58's got a metal ball grill that threads to a closing ring, and the 57 has a rotating plastic grill. That's it. But the geometry of each of the grills does alter the high frequency response slightly. So they don't sound exactly the same. And you can look at the frequency response graphs on the user guides and see what they are. Uh, the Unidyne 3 is also used in the 545 and the 565. The 565 has become really popular again now because of Freddie Mercury and uh, the movie they did about him because he was always a 565 user. And as we mentioned before, the SM7B is a Unidyne 3 variation. So is the 57 or 58 patented? Nope. But the Unidyne 3 microphone element was patented. And then when you have a patent on the element, that covers all the microphones that's used in there. So there is a utility patent, and by the way, a utility patent protects how a device operates or is, it's, or is used. But the 545 had a design patent that also applies to the SM57, and the design patent protects the visual characteristics or the appearance of a device. So let's take a look at the patents. Here's the uh, Unidyne utility patent for the Unidyne 3, 1966, Ernie Sealer. We mentioned Ernie before, and I do want to point out this. Simplified acoustical analog of the network inside. Yes, that is exactly the same network that you saw back in 1937 when Ben Bauer wrote that down into his notebook. So here's the utility patent for how it operates. And here's the design patent for the 545, which of course also applies to the SM57 because all the SM57 was was a 545 with a different um, finish on it and a different connector. You can see here it had the, originally in this patent drawing, they had an Amphenol connector. Unidyne 3 has only one moving part. It's a coil firing copper wire adhered to a Mylar diaphragm. That's the sole, sole moving part. Uh, the, by the way, the length of the voice coil wire is about 40 feet. But the total weight of the voice coil and the diaphragm is about two tenths of a gram. So one penny is three grams, and that's about the same as 15 Unidyne 3 diaphragm assemblies. That's how light they are. Gina, why don't you take this one? You like this one. <laughs> 
Well, you know, again, in technical support, there's a common uh, couple of common questions we get, um, and they tend to revolve around some sort of variation of what you see here. Uh, it, it usually is, you know, um, oh, my SM58 is overloading, my SM58 is distorting, or I'm hearing distortion, and we can guarantee you are not hearing distortion within the microphone itself, right? Um, and you know, there's 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 a couple of reasons for that. Uh, I guess I'm starting with the lower question first, right? Because that, that's the one that really is more common. Although the top question is often phrased as like, oh, my singer, my singer's so loud that she blew out our SM58. She blew it out. And it's like, no, you didn't do that, right? Because there's no singer uh, on earth that can produce enough sound pressure level to move the diaphragm so much that you damage it as uh, as it notes on the slide here right um the magnetic pole piece would stop it it just doesn't move if you could even make it move that far um and then as far as again like oh my sm58 is distorting again you know we, we we've done some some calculations and we figure that the, the the spl that um would cause distortion in a mic like the sm58 is about 174 db spl which is the equivalent of the of a space shuttle the space shuttle rockets taking off so i mean if you know a singer that can get that loud boy i'd like to meet that person but uh it, it it's it's really really unlikely and that's one of the reasons why if you look at microphone spec sheets you'll never see well i shouldn't say you never you'll very rarely see a max spl specification for a dynamic mic because it's just not relevant because it's it's not going to happen in any practical practical use. Um, you do see it for condenser microphones because the electronics and the condenser mic preamps are more will have a point where you can overload them uh, more easily, but you're not going to do it with, uh, with the Unidyne 3. Um, that's not to say you won't hear distortion, and you could if you know your gain structure isn't set right. So most of the time when someone is claiming that there's, you know, overloading or distorting their SM58, it's really the it, mixer is, is where you're seeing that, and that can be adjusted to be to be corrected. So uh, Unidyne 3s, no, uh, no, no human can create enough sound pressure level to damage and or overload the mic. Yeah, it, it, it is feasible. If you could be loud enough, you can get, we did calculations, you could get, get almost 10 volts peak to peak. Uh, I'll put up an SM58 without without it hitting the uh, the magnetic pole structure. <clears throat> unlikely, unlikely. Yeah. Anyways, just to wrap up some things here uh, before we get into the questions and answers. So this is just 58 trivia and arcana. I talked about the two tone handle. Uh, if you ever find those two tone handles, you know it's a mic made in the 60s or the 70s. That was made for radio and television and film studios. That's what SM stands for. It doesn't stand for sure microphones. It stands for studio microphones. The original 58 handles had a little step near down where the XLR connector, where all of a sudden the handle decreased in size. We've never been able to figure out, looking in the archives, why they did that. We think it was just a, a stylistic thing, and eventually we got rid of it because it wasn't, you know, it was an extra step in manufacturing and didn't do anything. The original 58 was dual low impedance, 50 ohms and 150 ohms. Interestingly enough, 150 ohms used to be considered medium ohms medium impedance uh, and 50 ohms was low impedance that goes back to broadcasting that's disappeared for a long time ago and now we consider 150 ohms low impedance there's air trapped inside the sm58 handle and the 57 handle and that's actually a key part of the vibration isolation mechanism that's in there so that you if you take uh, sm58 and you just take the element out and you don't have that trapped air handle not only do you use, lose some of the vibration isolation but it also affects, uh, affects the low end uh the 58 grill is designed to dent people say why do they dent it's like a crumple zone on a car body that's why we do it uh, you can, and by the way you can easily pound those off with a wooden file handle or the end of a broomstick uh, and also, the SM58 has been used aboard the International Space Station, which is pretty cool that uh, it's popular on the Earth and popular outside the Earth. So here it is, uh, 2021, 82 years after the debut of the first Unidyne microphone, and they continue to be popular, ones, twos, and threes, with engineers and performers and gamers and studio, recording studios. Uh, this is Roger Daltrey's microphone, by the way. He sent one back to us. It was the only one that ever failed from them. He wanted to know why. So did we. So we took the microphone, and we couldn't figure it out until we x-rayed down here, and we realized that this cable was crimped so tight that the actual conductors broke within the cable. 
and the microphone works just fine. He said, oh, why don't you keep it? You probably need one for the archives. So I guess our question is, uh, do you remember your first Unidyne? And I can say, yes, I do. I bought it in the late 60s when I was in a rock and roll band in Rockford, Illinois. Uh, my band didn't go anywhere, but our competitive bands, the guys that we knew pretty well did, a band called Cheap Trick. Uh, and I still have my first Unidyne as well. So with that, we'll wrap it up. Thank you very much. Hope it was enjoyable. And we'll take some questions now. And I'm going to stop sharing the screen so I can see people's faces. Is that okay with you guys? Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Gino. Uh, we do have a couple questions. Yep. So one is, uh, what were sure main competitors' models in their early days of the Unidyne 3? Wow. Hmm. I guess you know I've never looking at like I've, I've never said it. Electro voice certainly. Um, yeah, there was there were some there were some AKG dynamic microphones in the '60s. I don't know the model numbers. Uh, were they end addressed, Michael? Like the '58? Yeah, or that? I mean, because that was yeah, they were okay. Be Beatles Beetle mics on uh, Ed Sullivan. Mm. Those are AKGs. Yeah, but uh, good question. Had a but, couple offerings back then too, but yeah. they tended to be much more broadcast or recording studio oriented. Yeah, e EV also had you know they had the uh, <clears throat> the microphones with the low proximity effect. You know the the the, var the variable D. Oh, the variable D. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. 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 So uh, another question here is, uh, I guess this is really more of an opinion sort of thing, but what made sure eventually be the standard for? Uh, vocal mics. Gino, I, I have my own opinion. I'll, I'll see what Gino has to say. Yeah, I think it is kind of a matter of opinion, right? Well, I think yeah. um, it depends on if you, if you want to look at it from an actual more of a of a tech side of it, right? Which, or you want to look at it just from sort of a uh, a PR side of it. But I I I think you know when when we were talking about the presence peak earlier, right? Like and and how Ernie Sealer thought that was a design flaw and wanted to get rid of it, but um, it's it, it, it's such a benefit in terms of what was happening with music and, and PA systems at the time to have that presence peak, which if you, you know, the, the, the reason that that boost is, is important or useful is because that's the consonant range in, in Western speech. It looks like the S's, the T's, the P's, all those, those things that allow you to understand what people are saying is in that consonant range. And so you have a microphone that already kind of boosts or emphasizes that consonant range, um, then you you're you're going to help that microphone stick out or the vocal stick out ab amongst you know guitar amps and and cymbals and all these other things that are taking up snare drums things taking up a similar frequency range as the human voice or the lead vocal. And here's this mic. You put it on. You're like, oh, I can hear. I can understand the singer much better now. So that that was a big. Um, I think a big reason that it that it started being used in those applications, and then from there it just starts to snowball. And then you know how I mean, uh, I mean I'm 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 a sound guy, right? I mean we all know what kind of creatures of habits you can be, and you find something that works, you stick with it, and then the next generation comes up, and you got you just go here, use this. I mean there's no you know there's no discussion. The 58 is, and on top of that you pile on all the ruggedness and the reliability, the fact that you can't kill them, you can hammer nails with them, and it sounds really good. And and it's really consistent. I mean, geez, I'm starting to sound like a sales guy, but I mean, this is this is my own experience, though, as well, right? This is this is how it works, right? I mean, it's it's so so yeah, it 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 works. It keeps working, and and every every microphone that's you know kind of tried to knock it off its perch is really just a variation on the same theme. You know, every once in a while you'd have someone come out with, the, "Here's our new dynamic microphone that's much better than the SM58." Not to say there isn't other options. Or, I mean, that there's a million mics because just like there's a big box of crayons with all these different colors, pick the ones you like, <laughs> right? But there are kind of variations on that same initial theme that came from the Unidyne 3. Okay, I'm done now. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, you know, reliability and durability. In 45 years, I've traveled around the world for sure, and nowhere did anybody say, uh, I don't want to talk to you. you know, your stuff fails. I, I think if nothing else, people know it's reliable and durable. <laughs> And keep in mind, Mr. Sure put his name. Mr. Sure put his name on the company. You know, he didn't want anything that went out there that didn't live up to his family name. And, and I'll add you know, something that I read somebody else say about the SM57, with, uh, in particular, but it applies, which is, you know, the SM57. It may never 
uh, it may not always be the best choice, but it'll never be a bad choice. Yeah, there's, yeah, there's the thing. There's no, no, yeah, no Sandman's ever been fired for thinking that's in 57 <laughs> or something. True. Right. Yep. <laughs> yeah. So uh, just another question, kind of going back to the early days of uh, Unidyne 3. Since there was the 545 and the 565, which were obviously staples at that particular point in time, the next generation uh, was the SM, the 56, followed by 5758. Uh, what were the performance differences in the cartridges chosen for those two series, the general line and the SM line? None. The Unidyne 3s. None? None. Absolutely none. Oh, Absolutely none. To, to, completely to wrong theory. information on the internet. They are uni if it says Unidyne 3, that's the motor. So. Okay. So same cartridges, <laughs> basically. Yeah. Same yeah, cartridges. Yeah. 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 Okay. Just doing a little myth busting, that's all. <laughs> No, it While you're on subject, I will mention though that the SM48 is not a Unidyne 3. It is a different cartridge for those of you who know what an yeah. SM48 is. But they're also uh, not yeah. discarded 58s either. There used to be another internet rumor oh, that the SM48 yeah. are SM58s that don't pass quality, which is again not they don't even look that much the same. So that's not true no. either. So we could myth yeah. myth bust all day long. <laughs> yeah. So there was another question here, uh, and that was, could you take us through the uh, the SM7, the SM7A, and SM7B, that evolution? You want, want me to do it, Gino? Yeah, you go for it. Yeah, it's, 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 they're very simple. Uh, the SM7 stayed exactly the same from 1972 to 1999. No changes. Uh, in 1999, we did two things. We changed the yoke a little bit to make it easier to manufacture, but the primary thing we did was improve the humbucking coil. And the reason with that was radio stations started using CRT monitors close to the microphones to put the text up that the DJs would read. And the CRT monitors had local magnetic fields and the microphones would hum. So we had to improve the humbucking coil. And then two years later, 2001, we brought out the SM7B. SM7B is nothing but an SM7A with the big windscreen. And we put that big windscreen on it because we got tired of people saying, you need to bring back the SM, thank you, Gino, you need to bring back the SM5B. It was the best microphone ever. So we thought... Maybe if we made the SM7 look like an SM5B, it would sell better. <laughs> Turns out it didn't need any help to sell better. It just needed uh, podcasters and gamers to get on board. Yeah, so that was it. No other differences. Yep. Oh, cool. So, uh, Gino, maybe you might uh, inform the group here uh, watching of what the latest... Uh, version of dynamic microphone development has been at sure uh, be ksm8 of course ksm8 yes well uh yeah we kind of mentioned that one a little bit earlier and and it it <laughs> what i just said a couple of minutes ago right was that you know the the, dyna the dynamic mic that was you know uh developed by ernie sealer the unidyne 3 was pretty much unchanged that technology was you know pretty static for the longest time except you know you had things like okay now we're going to use the neodymium magnet instead of the alnico magnet and now we're going to have you know hypercardioid and supercardioid and all these different patterns and all things but it was still basically diaphragm voice coil using that you know that that uniphase principle uh what made the the ksm8 different was um you know the there was people who you know, well there's an opportunity to make an sm58 um like microphone that was designed for a higher end or higher tier customer maybe in the pro sound touring realm something like that who you know maybe they they're, they're just experimenting and looking for something better right um they want something more condenser like but maybe not with some of the downsides of the condenser and what we ended up looking at was um what if we put two diaphragms in there instead of just one how can how can we combine those in a way that will um give us give us something different something unique and the benefits of the dual diaphragm that you have in the ksm8 um do uh do two things for you number one they actually result in a in a smoother frequency response right something that is a little bit um more natural still has that presence peak that you want in a in a close-up handheld 
vocal mic, but it's just a little, you know, just a little smoother, a little more natural sounding. And then the big thing is it helps control the proximity effect, which, um, again, if you don't know what that is, that's that increase in low frequency response that you get as you get closer to a unidirectional microphone. The closer you get, the bassier it gets. Uh, and that can sometimes be an advantage, but can also be a disadvantage, especially if you don't keep a consistent distance between your mouth and the microphone, you can get a real variation in low frequency response. So by the dual diaphragm sort of allowing that um, proximity effect to be more controlled, then the, the, the frequency response of the microphone stays more consistent and gives the, the vocalist kind of a bigger working range with the microphone in and of itself. And there's some some videos on our on our website and YouTube page that kind of kind of graphically show sort of how this works. But uh, it, it really yields a, a pretty impressive sounding microphone and is, you know, kind of, again, the, one of the, the first sort of major um, major new inventions in dynamic mic technology probably since the Unidyne 3. So it's a yeah, really it's cool about, microphone. Too, it's five or six years to develop, too. It's just it'll, yeah. it'll forever. I mean, mm -hmm. er Ernie got it right with the Unidyne 3. I mean, it's the it's the Coca-Cola bottle. It's the Coca-Cola formula. You don't mess with that, right? And so it was really, <laughs> right. it, it took a while to uh, All right. do this. Well, yeah, that's someone asked me that. Yeah, go ahead. No, so that's why the Beta 58 didn't replace the SM58, right? Because, yeah. you know, again, you know, you know you're not going to get rid of – it was a bad idea to get rid of old Coke, right? <laughs> so you keep both around and you let people choose the one that they like. Right. Yeah, exactly. Well, gentlemen, we're coming up on – well, coming up on our hour. Yeah, we're over time. We're actually past our hour here. <laughs> yeah, we well, yeah. um, I tell you what, there's uh, – uh, really, one more question here. That's this is a really easy one. Uh, how are beta microphones different uh, from others, or are they? Go ahead, Gino. Right. Well, th there you go. So, the, uh, like I alluded to earlier with the Beta Fifty Eight, the the original Beta microphones, uh, the Beta Fifty Seven and Beta Fifty Eight, were uh, the only two. They were just dynamic mics. So at the time when there was only dynamic mics, it was very easy to say that, oh, neodymium magnet, super cardioid pickup pattern uh, gives you, and so you have slightly hotter output due to the neodymium magnet, uh, about 60 B or so, and um, and a brighter frequency response. It actually kind of got you a little bit more high end. So uh, if you like something that has a little, a little more top end than your SM58, you would get that with your beta 58 or your beta 57. So when you're comparing, you know, dynamic mics like that, uh, apples to apples, that's what it is. Of course, now the beta mics, I mean, there's all different kinds of condenser mics from, you know, the first one was the beta 87 uh, vocal, handheld vocal condenser microphone. But then you got into, you know, there's a there's beta 181s and there's beta 98s and beta 91s and that's all kinds of, you know, condenser mics that sort of round out that line and, and make it different. But, but looking just at 57s and 58s, it's that neo Dimia magnet with the super cardioid pattern. Awesome. And people, and that's, and we can close with, uh, we can close with another question that we get a lot at sure, which is like, uh, well, which one should I buy? The SM58 or the Beta 58? <laughs> and of course, you know, buy all of them. Explain that way you're always prepared. It, there you go. Yes. You're right. <laughs> Mm. Oh, gentlemen, thank you so very much for for joining us. This this has been a wonderful, a wonderful. Welcome, evening. Jay. Uh, and Nate, do you have some closing uh, comments here? Uh, yeah, I'll go ahead and again, thanks, uh, Michael and Gino. That was wonderful. We could certainly listen to you guys talk all night long, um, but we do want to be mindful of everyone's time. So we'll go ahead and end it here. Uh, before I do close out the evening, I want to remind everyone to hit like and subscribe on this video. Also, uh, head over to Central Indiana section of the Audio Engineering Society's website at centralindianaaes.org. Uh, we have all sorts of info there from past events, future events, as well as our mailing list sign up. Links to anything you need to know uh, is located there. Um, also, just a reminder, we'll be sending out a post-event survey this evening to all the registered participants. Please fill that out. And then... Uh, I'd like to give one more thanks to Gino and Michael, and thank you, Jay, for moderating this evening. Uh, wonderful job, and as well as Force Technology Solutions, uh, who helped provide the production facility and logistics for tonight to make this happen. So thank you guys very much. Uh, I think that brings us to the end of the program, and uh, thanks again. We'll see you next time.